Alrighty, good morning. So glad you're with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, um, if you could do us a favor, on the seat or pew in front of you, there should be a little white card. If you could take that and fill out your information, and then at the end of the service, if you could just toss that into one of the collection boxes that are on each of the exits as you leave so we can get a record of your visit. We greatly appreciate that. Um, like I said, our collection boxes are on each on the wall by each of the exits, and so we will not be having an offertory for the foreseeable future. So if you feel led to give to any of our offerings this morning. If the Lord is leading you that way, just drop those in there on your way out, and we greatly appreciate that. A few other announcements we have. Um, if you are in any way uh, work with our young people with Awanas, if you're a teacher, if you're a listener, if you're a worker of any kind, we are having a meeting at 6 o'clock this coming Wednesday, the 23rd, 6 o'clock. We're going to have a meeting of all of our leadership together, so mark that on your calendars and try and be here if you can. If you cannot, please uh, let Joyce know that. Oh, and it will be in the K building as well. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so yeah, six o'clock in the K building this Wednesday. Um, if you're leading uh, with our Awanas at all, uh, be sure you make that meeting. Also, um, since May, since the shut, since we came back from uh, our shutdowns and our quarantines, we've been our Wednesday night services have been going from 6:30 to 7:30. Um, starting in October, we're going to go back to our normal uh, Wednesday night midweek services. So we're going to go from 6 to 7:30, starting Wednesday, October 7th. That's the first Wednesday in October. So make a note of that. Um, if you have any kiddos, or if you have any youth, or if you come here for a uh, prayer meeting, Bible study, that we're moving back to our old uh, schedule on Wednesday nights from 6 to 7.30, and that will be starting the first Wednesday of October. Um, this week starts our week of prayer for, Re for the Reach Texas State Missions offering. Our goal as a church is $3,000, so be praying about uh, what the Lord is laying in your heart to give to that. Every single penny that you give for that offering um, goes to missionaries, uh, both in Texas and out of state, I believe. Oh, it's in state Texas, uh, state missionaries. So uh, be praying um, for that. Our goal as a church is $3,000, okay? So that's all I have in way of announcements. Let me pray for us as we continue in our worship service. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much um, for today. I thank you so much, Lord, that we get to gather into your house, Father. We get to worship your name, that we get to open your word. God, I pray that our hearts never take for granted the gift we have in that. And Father, I pray that you use this time. Use this time to speak to us. Use this time to move in us. And Lord, I pray that you use this time to draw us closer to you, that you shape us and form us to look more like your son when we leave than when we came in here. We love you, Father. It's your name I pray. Amen.
All right, we're going to continue our singing. We are going to sing hymn number 139. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the last verses of At the Cross. And we're going to sing hymn number 273, Freely, Freely. And then we're going to sing the choruses that we sang to start the service. Stand with us at the cross.
was lost in darkest night yet thought I knew the way the sin had promised joy and life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to will and if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still but as I ran my hellbound race indifferent to the cost you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross and I beheld God's love displayed you saw strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my soul Thank you, Marie. What a what a beautiful song and and fitting, um, isn't it? He is our all. Um, so glad that you're here with us today and able to come and um, worship with us. Um, it's a it's a blessing, isn't it, for us to get to uh, be together in this place? Something that I don't think we will ever take for granted again. And so we're glad that you're here with us this morning. I want to lead us in a word of prayer one more time. I. I feel like our music this morning has just led us right to the throne, hasn't it? And just prepared our hearts. And so I want to lead us in a, just a word of prayer um, before we open God's word together. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning for um, the blessing uh, of getting to um, come before you in worship. God, that's a privilege. Father, whether we're sitting here in this building this morning or, or whether we're worshiping you from our homes this morning or, or listening to this live stream worshiping, um, God, every time that we have opportunity to come into your presence, God, what, what a blessing. And Lord, your word tells us, Father, that um, God, as we worship you, Father, that you inhabit the praises of your people. God, that we're two or more gathered in your name, that you're in their midst. So, Father, this morning, as we're in this place together, we know that um, you are here with us. You're here. 
And God, there might be a lot of different reasons, a lot of different purposes that we have um, gathered in this place or tuned in this morning. And God, but I, I believe without a doubt, Lord, that um, God, whatever those reasons might be that you desire to speak into our life right where we are. And God, beyond what I can do behind a pulpit or what anybody else can do, Father, your Holy Spirit can take your word. And God, you can speak it right where we are. So Lord, I pray that as we enter into this time when we're going to open Scripture together, Lord, your word says about itself, it doesn't return empty. It won't return void. God, I believe that there is power in your word. God, you can probe hearts and lives, my own included. God, like nothing else can. And this morning, we pray for that. Open us up, Lord. Help us get honest with ourselves about ourselves. Help us get honest before you. God, help us welcome your voice in our life and what you want to say to us. Lord, for the next few minutes, just settle us in for a minute. God, there's so many things going on in our world and around us right now that can keep us, hinder us from hearing you. God, help us for the next little bit just to give you this time to speak into our life. Holy Spirit, fall on us in this place. What you do here in this place today, we will give you and you alone all the praise, all the honor. All the glory. This is about you, not us. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you have your Bible with you this morning, we want to get back into our series that we've been in for the past few weeks. And uh, really this morning, we're going to be wrap, wrapping up um, this series of messages that we've been calling just simply Wrestle. Um, I know that um, when you have a group of people kind of gathered in a place like this, there's some people that you hear the word wrestle and you might go, yuck, right? Um, I don't like wrestling. Um, and it's a good thing because we're not talking about wrestling in that sense. We're talking about the things we wrestle with. Um, as believers. And this has just been kind of a short series. Um, in case you've never really kind of probed it in Scripture, you will discover that in the Bible, there's a lot of references to things we wrestle with, to things that um, we struggle with. We've looked at a couple of those already this morning. We're going to be in the book of Romans. Be finding that with me if you would. We'll be in Romans, the seventh chapter. Um, again, we've titled this series um, just by the simple name wrestle and one of the things we've discovered over the last few weeks is um, there's a lot of things we wrestle with right um, in our life um, not just um, spiritual things either we wrestle every single day with important decisions um, we wrestle with relationships with with family with our kids with you know we wrestle with those we wrestle with health issues um, we, what we, we wrestle with world concerns, things that are going on around us all the time. Um, and I want you just to think about that with me this morning as we're kind of getting into this and just really kind of probe your own life for a second and just get honest with yourself. Um, just kind of ask yourself w within you, um, what am I wrestling with in my life right now that maybe nobody else knows about, nobody really sees it, what are the things um, in me that cause me to wrestle? I shared this quote with you last week from Dr. David Jeremiah, and I think it's a good one kind of for us to kind of start on this morning and kind of think about. But um, Dr. Jeremiah says this. He says, Christians today are wrestling with God-sized questions that are more relevant than ever before. And I think that's really true, isn't it, that we're we're wrestling with some big things, even, even internally within ourselves, but, but even as churches, we're wrestling with a lot of things. Um, we're wrestling with a lot of things in our culture, in our country, um, in our world. There's just some big God-sized things that we wrestle with. Um, now, here's what I can tell you, that we have all all of us, we, we have all these things that we wrestle about all the time. We wrestle with things emotionally and mentally. But, but I think maybe the big question for us as we've done this study is kind of on the spiritual level, isn't it? Like, 
What are the spiritual things we wrestle with? And you go, well, you know, a lot of people don't even recognize the spiritual struggle that goes on. They don't, they don't recognize the things that you wrestle with, with, with kind of spiritually. So we've talked about a couple of them. The first week we were together, we were in the Old Testament book of Genesis with the patriarch Jacob as he wrestled with God in the Old Testament. We talked about wrestling with God that first week. Remember that? And, and let me just give these things to you really quickly in the way of review, but we basically said that there's really tr- three truths that kind of emerged from that Old Testament passage of Jacob wrestling with God, three simple truths about wrestling with God that we need to grab hold of and realize in our life. Number one was this, that we all wrestle with God on some levels, because here's what we know is that God loves us. And that he's constantly drawing us to himself. And there's this wrestling match that goes on between us and him. Our will and his will. It happens in churches like this. In services like this where God begins to speak. And he begins to probe our life. Maybe begins to step on our toes. And there comes resistance from us. And God is speaking. So really on some level we all wrestle with God. There are even those outside the church who wrestle all the time with God and don't even recognize it. That is that God is trying to reveal himself to him and they're wrestling with him saying, but I don't believe in God. I don't even believe in spiritual things. But God is wrestling because he loves you and he desires to draw you to us. So we all wrestle with him. Here's the second little truth that we kind of said with that one. And again, these are just kind of in the way of review, but I think they're worth us repeating. The second thing we kind of discovered about wrestling with God is that when you wrestle with God, you're going to get broken. All right? Here, here's a simple truth you need to understand. If you wrestle with God, you're not going to win. I mean, right? God's a big boy. He's a lot bigger than you. And you're not going to win that wrestling match. You can fight with all of your might, but God's bigger than you. And you're not going to ultimately win that wrestling match. We kind of discovered that. We discovered that when you wrestle with God, he will break you. And literally we saw that in the story of Jacob wrestling with God because what happened? God touched his hip and broke his hip. He was a broken man and he couldn't wrestle anymore. God brought him to that place. And so we recognize that, you know, and I think it's an important point for us to understand that before we really begin to experience who God is, there's going to have to be some breaking. And then the third thing we discovered about wrestling with God is that when you wrestle with God, it will change you. I mean, you can't help but be changed when you come face to face with God. With Jacob, we saw that he literally changed him. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. From Jacob, cheater, deceiver, trickster, what his name means, to Israel, which means God prevails. God rules. He was changed. That was the Old Testament, right? So we were in the Old Testament with Jacob. We talked about wrestling with God, and literally Scripture talked about wrestling wrestling with God. Then we jumped to the New Testament with the Apostle Paul, and we talked about how we don't only wrestle with God, but we wrestle with the enemy, right? Last time we were together. And Paul said it like this in Ephesians 6, 12. He said it plain out to us. He said, for we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. He said it straight out. Listen, Christian, listen, believer, you're going to wrestle with the enemy. It's going to happen. And so we kind of jumped from wrestling with God. Then last week we saw literally in the New Testament how Paul says, listen, you're wrestling against spiritual forces. You're wrestling against the enemy. And we said last time we were together that there were three kind of essential keys for us winning the victory against the enemy. Number one, realize you're in a wrestling match. That when you sign up with God, When you get on God's team, when you accept Jesus Christ into your life and you become his, listen, whatever is an enemy of God automatically becomes an enemy of yours. And you have to understand that if you're trying to serve God, the enemy doesn't want you to serve God. So what's he going to do? Wrestle. We need to realize as Christians that we're in a wrestling match. Then we said this, we need to recognize who you're fighting. Listen, folks, we're in a spiritual battle today. And a lot of people don't acknowledge that. They look at all the flesh and blood things that are going around us. We're constantly talking about the world and all of these things. And listen, Paul said it straight out. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood here. We're we're in a spiritual 
wrestling match with the enemy. And remember last time we were together, when we were here last week, we said, listen, Scripture is very clear about what that enemy wants to do. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember that? Realize who you're wrestling with. And then the third thing we said is we need to reach for the source of our victory. The context of that passage of Scripture where Paul talks about wrestling with the enemy is the armor of God passage. And we go, well, we know what our resources are. They're the armor of God. But remember what we discovered? What's the resource? Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 6.10. Stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Jesus is our resource. That's how we win the victory. So we've been wrestling for the last few weeks, right? We've wrestled, talked about wrestling with God and struggling with things he's wanting to do in our life. Then we've talked about the enemy, about how the enemy wants to wrestle with us and keep us from living from him. And this morning, we're going to turn to one more that I think is very prominent in Scripture, and it's an important one. Not that the other two aren't. Oh, listen, we don't want to minimize in any way the idea that we're going to wrestle with God. And there's even going to be some this morning because of this topic who are going to wrestle with God because God loves you that much. And there's going to be some this morning going to wrestle with the enemy in this topic because you're going to say, oh, you're not so bad, right? So we recognize that this is all kind of going on simultaneously. But I want us to think about this one this morning because today we're going to talk about what may be one of the most uncomfortable subjects that ever gets addressed anymore. It's one of those things we don't like to have to come face to face with. This is such an important area where we're going to talk about today. And I'll just say it, maybe one of the problems is that we don't rest nearly enough in the area we're going to talk about. I mean, I would even go so far as to say that we don't hear many sermons on this topic anymore. This morning, we've talked about wrestling with God. We've talked about wrestling with the enemy. This morning, we're going to talk about wrestling with sin wrestling with sin. If you notice in your bulletin this morning, you may have you may have already been kind of debating wrestling in your mind whether you're even going to stay today, right? Because the preacher's fixing to preach on sin. And the truth of the matter is, just think about this. We don't hear that many sermons on sin anymore. Have you ever tried to get your head around that? Why is that? Why don't we hear just just many sermons today just preached on the topic of sin? Why why don't we do that? because it's too uncomfortable, right? I mean, because it steps on our toes. It feels too awkward. It's not one of those inviting subjects, right? When you start talking about the topic of sin and those kind of things, we've kind of sort of gone soft on sin in lots of ways. We've kind of watered it down, renamed it, tried to make it more palatable to the taste, right? Because we don't want to have to confront those things. We don't want someone pointing their finger at us and saying I'm a sinner. And I think today the church really kind of shies away from pointing the finger at anyone else and saying they're a sinner. Why? Because we recognize when the church is, we're the same, right? We got the same problem. Jeremiah Johnson, who writes for a great little kind of website that's called Desiring God, he says this, and I thought this was an interesting statement. He said this, you don't hear much about sin from pulpits anymore recognizing and identifying it, wrestling with the guilt of it, repenting of it, or for that matter, dealing with it at all. Those ideas are passe in most churches today. I mean, he just kind of said what we all know, right, out there, is that we just don't hear many sermons on that anymore. And lest you think I'm just kind of grasping at straws from from some religious folks who kind of say we don't wrestle with it. There was an interesting article that I saw this week from Newsweek Matic Magazine. That's a secular magazine. And Kenneth Woodward is writing an article in that that really caught my attention, and it was simply entitled, Why We Don't Talk About Sin Anymore. And boy, it caught my attention. And Kenneth Woodward said this. He said, 90% of Americans say they believe in God, and yet the urgent sense of personal sin has all but disappeared from the current upbeat style in American religion. Isn't that interesting? In earlier areas, ministers regularly exhorted congregations to humbly confess our sins. But the aging baby boomers who are rushing back to church do not want to hear sermons that might rattle their self-esteem. And many clergy who are competing in a buyer's market feel they cannot afford to alienate. 
What a perspective, right? So, so what do we do today? We soft pedal it, right? I mean, we try to kind of water it down. We don't want to say anything that might make someone too uncomfortable, that, someone, that it might make somebody kind of alienated or feel distanced from us. And we, we definitely kind of have all these services now that are desired to be seeker-friendly and definitely don't want to push anybody away. So we soft pedal it. Now, here's the danger with that. Let me just say this, okay? Sin sends people to hell. Sin separates people from God. Sin keeps people out of relationship. And listen to me, Christian. Sin keeps Christians from being what God's called you to be as a believer. We better be addressing it. But, but we're not. And so here's what I want you to kind of understand. I want us this morning to just lean into this. Again, I titled this message today, Wrestling with Sin. This is the third in the series, and it's the last one. So next week when you come back, you can go, I'm glad that's over, right? I'm tired of wrestling, Right? Well, listen, you can just get tired of wrestling because it's not going away. I mean, I could quit talking about it, but you're still going to be in a wrestling match with God because he loves you. And it's going to be that strong. You're still going to be in a wrestling match with the enemy. And can I say this to you? You're still going to wrestle with sin. Even after you walk away from this place today. I want to take you to a passage of scripture this morning. I hope you found it by now. To Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans chapter seven. And we're going to look at a very... Interesting, very complex, very powerful passage of Scripture in verses 14 through 25. I think this passage of Scripture is so important for Christians to read and understand and lean into if you never have. I don't know about you, but when I read this passage of Scripture, I see a man sold out to God who is honest about wrestling with sin. Now, now here's what we know about Christians, right? I mean, we put our Sunday go to meet and clothes on on Sunday, and our smell went on, we smell good, right? And we look really good, and we walk in with a big smile on our face. But the truth of the matter is, we as Christians are wrestling with some stuff in our own life that we don't want anybody else to see. We don't want anybody else to know about that. And I'm just telling you, listen, if we're going to be all God's called us to be, we better get honest about it. And Paul gets honest in this passage of Scripture. If you're there with me, look at it with me if you would. Romans chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading in verse 14 and read on to verse 25. And let me just warn you, as we get into this, you're going to go, what's wrong with Paul? Is, is Paul schizophrenic? Is he crazy? What's he dealing with here? I mean, just listen. This sounds like a guy that's conflicted, that's wrestling Get that as we read this. Look at it with me if you would. Here we go. Romans chapter 7, beginning in the 14th verse. Here's what Paul writes. For we know that the law is spiritual. But Paul says, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. Now listen to what he says. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. What do you think he's talking about? Sin, sin. What I want to do, I don't do. What I hate, I keep doing. That's what Paul is saying. That's, that's very interesting. Verse 16, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, literally wrestling against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the laws of sin, which is in my member. Look at verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm so glad verse 25 is there or else we would have been going, ich, right? What a horrible chapter. But verse 25 says this, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So then, with the mind I serve, myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Do you see the wrestling match going on there with Paul? 
this wrestling thing. I want to please God. I want to live for him. I want to not do the sin thing again. I want to be over that. I want to stop the struggle and the wrestling. But here's what I know. The very things I want to do, that's not what I keep doing. And you can see the struggle, the wrestling match that's going on with him in this passage of Scripture. Now, I want you to understand something as you read this passage. It's almost like if you're not careful, you'll read it saying, well, Paul seems to be saying, it's not me that's the problem. It's it's the sin, right? I mean, it's the sin that's the problem. I want you to understand that in this passage of Scripture, Paul is not excusing sin. He's not rationalizing it. He's not trying to make amends for that. He, he's not saying that. He's just being quite honest with us and saying, listen, you need to understand that as long as you walk this earth, you're going to wrestle with sin. And the very things you don't want to do, those things are going to hold you captive. But there's hope. There's a victory that you can find as you wrestle with sin. Now, i got to tell you that I was working on this message of Scripture. I thought this is what the church and Christians need to hear today. We need to get honest about where we are. Because I'm going to tell you that a lot of churches today have lost their power and their purity because we have Christians who are captured, captivated by sin, and they've just given up the fight. They can't beat it, so what do we do? We hide it. We tuck it deep down inside instead of ever dealing with it. And I think Romans chapter 7 is Paul saying to us as Christians, listen, deal with it. Wrestle with it. Find victory over it finally, and you will find an abundant life you never knew you could experience. You'll begin to soar at who God has called you to be in Christ Jesus. You can find the victory. I think Paul did, but he's going to be honest with us here, and he's going to say, listen, you're going to wrestle with sin. And that's key in this passage, and I don't want us to miss that. I don't want us to walk away from that and go, listen, we've wrestled with God, we've wrestled, with, but what about this personal thing where we're constantly struggling within ourselves? And here's what we do as Christians. I know how the game goes. I've tried and tried and tried. I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to commit that sin again. I'm never going to say those bad things again. I'm never going to talk about people again. I'm never going to gossip again. I'm never going to slander again. I'm never going to practice those things again. And we try with all of our might to do it only to find that we can't, right? Where is the victory? How can I wrestle with this thing called sin and win? I think that's what Paul's after here in this passage of Scripture. And I want us to lean into it. I want us to understand it. I want us to kind of grasp hold of what he's saying. So this morning, as we're kind of talking about this together and kind of leaning into it, I want you and I to just kind of look at some keys to victory in wrestling sin. I mean, we've talked about what it means to wrestle with God. We've talked about finding victory as we wrestle with the enemy. But what about personally within ourselves, this thing that keeps beating us up, that that keeps ripping into us? So here it is. You ready? Jot these things down. I want to move through them fairly quickly in the time that we have, but I want you to get these things down because I think Paul is telling us this right in our passage of Scripture, right from God's Word in Romans chapter 7. This is about, to me, how to find victory as we wrestle with sin. Here's number one. You ready? This is going to sound so simple and so basic, but stay with me on this. Here's number one. First of all, to find victory over sin, admit you wrestle. You say, to who? To everybody. Admit it to yourself. Admit it to God. He already knows, right? I mean, admit that you wrestle. Admit that you're not perfect. By the way, you won't be until you're standing in his presence. There is no such thing as sinless perfection. There's only one perfectly sinless man who ever walked this earth, and you're not him, right? Right? So, so here's what we need to do to begin this kind of wrestling match is to admit it. Admit we wrestle. Quit hiding behind, and, and I'm using this, okay, not literally because I know some of you are wearing masks, okay? We as Christians need to quit hiding behind the mask of personal piety and spirituality. You get it? We need to quit that. We need to quit pretending to be something that we're not. As we, If we're the perfect goody-goody little Christian at church that doesn't have any struggles in their life. Because here's what I can tell you 100% from the pulpit to the back pew, we do. We are all wrestling with things. And you know what part of the wrestling match with the enemy is? He knows just how to dangle the bait in front of you that appeals most to you. 
whatever it is. And what it is for you and what it is for me may be two different things, but one of the things I can tell you 100% that every single one of us wrestle with sin in our life, every single one of us. Now, in our passage of Scripture, I think this is, is quite remarkable. I said as we kind of begin this that chapter 7, verses 14 through 2, is pretty controversial. There have been biblical scholars, okay, and I always put quotation marks because you've got to use that loosely sometimes. What qualifies a person as an expert? I, I don't know, really. Lots of study. I mean, some people are educated to be on their intelligence, right? So I don't know if lots of study qualifies you as an expert or not, but biblical scholars argue and debate over what this is about. There are some who come along and say, oh, well, Paul cannot be possibly be talking about his life as a Christian because Christians ought not to struggle with sin. Paul has to be talking about his life before he became a Christian. Now listen to me. That's malarkey. Study your scripture and you will discover that in this passage of scripture, he is speaking in the present tense. All through this passage of scripture, which tells me Paul's talking about his life, not in the past, but at that moment, what he was struggling with in that moment. And listen, as a Christian, let me just be honest with you. I find that comforting, strangely comforting. And here's why, because it helps me get honest with myself. You know what? If Paul wrestled with sin, buddy, you're probably going to wrestle with sin too. If Paul struggled with sin in his life, I can promise you that the people that are sitting in your church are struggling with sin, just like Paul did. And when Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about these kind of ideas, listen, the very things I want to do, those are not the things I do. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I keep doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's Paul in the present as a believer. And I got to tell you, if that's Paul as a believer, that's me as a believer. I'm going to wrestle, I'm going to struggle with the same things. Now notice in our passage of Scripture, verses 14 and 15 again, just notice what he says here. This is very interesting. Paul says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I, Paul, am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. That I do. You see it? So, so you see his kind of personal struggle. And I love this. Listen, he's acknowledging within himself that he wrestles. We all wrestle. I love Keith Green from years back. Keith Green was killed in a plane crash years and years ago now. But boy, what a prophetic voice, right? I mean, he didn't just sing. He preached. And he said about this passage of Scripture, which is interesting that he commented on this. And he's kind of talking about those who say that this is before Paul became a Christian, that Christians shouldn't struggle. Here's what Keith Green said. He said this, I don't know if Paul is talking about his life before or after he got saved. All I know is that it sounds a lot like me. I mean, read this passage of Scripture and just between you and God and just get honest as you're reading it. And here's what you'll say. I, I don't know about all the technical background of this passage, but boy, it sounds a lot like me. The very things I don't want to do, why do I keep doing those, God? I know it breaks your heart. I know it's against who you've called me to be. Why do I keep? And the very things that I want to do, those are the things I seem to fail at. I mean, I read this passage of Scripture, and something within it resonates with the wrestling match that goes on in Buddy all the time, right? You, you, you get that. And, and here's what I think. I think that you and I, we just need to get honest about the fact that we wrestle. We wrestle with sin. Now, our culture, our society has all kinds of answers for why that is. Some argue that if we could just take care of the human predicament, that sin would take care of itself. Some have argued that human evil comes from bad surroundings, right? Right, that, that sin and those comes from, from just people being around the wrong people. And there's some truth to that, right? But, but listen, that would be an easy enough fix. If all I had to do was just fix the people I hang around with and, and the, my surroundings, then a lot of us could probably work our way out of this wrestling match, right? So, so that's not the answer. Surely that's not, that's not the clue. I mean, we know that bad company corrupts good morals, Right? We kind of get that. But if that's all that it was, if that was the sole answer, we could just remove ourselves from that situation and we wouldn't sin anymore. But we still do. It's kind of like that scene from the great epic of American philosophy, Hee Haw. 
on Hee Haw. And by the way, you can watch Hee Haw again, all right? Just scroll around and you'll find it. Those are classics, right? On Hee Haw, there's a character called Doc Campbell. Y'all remember Doc Campbell? Doc Campbell is confronted by a patient who says that he broke his arm in two places. And the doc replies, well, then stay out of them places, right? I mean, if that's all it took for us to fix our sin problem, we could just stay out of them places. You, you get that. So, so some kind of say, it's just bad surrounding. Some others say, well, the problem with evil and the reason we stem is because of poverty and deprivation. I can tell you that's wrong because rich people sin just as much as poor people. Rich people just have more money to spend on it. Right? That's not the answer. So, so here, here's the thing, listen, we throw things at this sin situation all the time, and the truth of the matter is we're just like Paul. The very things that I want to do, those are the things I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I keep doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You and I need to recognize in our own life that we struggle with this. Adrian Rogers, who's now gone to be with the Lord, he was fond of saying, and he would say this often, he would weave it into a sermon, he would make this statement. He would say, I sin all I want to. You know what he's saying? I mean, I choose to do this. I sin all I want to. And then he would add, I just don't want to, but I still do it. Now, now think of this, John Newton. You all know the name John Newton, right? Probably wrote the greatest Christian hymn of all time. Who can name it? Amazing Grace, right? Right? John Newton knew what a wretched man he was when God found him. He knew that, right? And he wrote about it in that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Worm Like Me, right? And, and I think John Newton lived there the rest of his life, recognizing that God had saved him as a sinner. But what's interesting to me is that he never lost sight of that. He never wanted himself to not remember what a sinner he really was. On his deathbed, John Newton is said to have made this statement. Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very queer clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. I love that, don't you? Listen, we just need to be honest. We wrestle. I mean, we wrestle 100% of the time we wrestle in this life. We wrestle with this thing called sin. Now, let, let me give you three facts really quickly about this, and I want you to get this. This is under point number one, okay? So, sub points here. <laughs> You're gonna get them. You got it? Don't forget this. Number one, God loves you even when you continue to struggle to wrestle. Please don't forget that. As you are getting honest with yourself about wrestling, what you need to know is God loves you even though you wrestle with sin, even though you're in the struggle. Here's the second one. God loved you before the struggle. He loved you before you started wrestling. He loved you when you weren't willing to admit it. You get it? I mean, he loved you that much. And here's the third one. He will love you after the struggle. And I love that. Why would we not be willing to get honest about the fact that we wrestle when we serve that kind of a God who's gone to great lengths to enter into the fight with us? I mean, that's powerful to me. And I could stop right there and we could kind of end it, but you know I'm not going to, right? Because the first thing we need to do to find victory in this wrestling is just admit that we wrestle. Here's the second one. You ready? Confess your defeat. You go, wait a minute, you're saying I'm going to wrestle and I'm going to lose? That's exactly what I'm saying. You're saying I'm going to wrestle and I'm going to get beat up? That's exactly what I'm saying. Isn't that what Paul was saying? Read Romans 7, 14 through 25, and you're going to hear a guy that's saying to you, listen, I'm getting beat up in this wrestling match. Bad. I'm losing this thing on every front. I, I, I keep falling and failing here. Matt Chandler says this, and I love Matt Chandler, and he, he kind of hits it right out of the park a lot of times with his statements. And here's, here's what he says. He's a great preacher, and he says this, I preach hard 
against the idea and plead with people to make war against sin, I tell them it's not going to be easy. Some people are meant to wrestle with their sins a long time before God brings them to freedom. But let's wrestle. Let's fight. Let's do something besides just complain. I think that's a powerful statement, right? The reality is we're going to wrestle, right? And we're going to get beat up in this fight. Why? Because we're sinners. We're going to fail here. And God understands. And remember what I just said. I gave you those three things right there to close up that first point. God loves you even as you continue to struggle. God loved you before the struggle. And God will love you after the struggle. He's not going to quit loving you. But here's the thing. You're going to struggle. Now, I was going to read a large section of this passage of Scripture, but I want you just to look at your Bible there. If you have your Bible there open to Romans chapter 7, I just want you to look at this. And I'm not going to back all the way up to verse 6, but beginning in verse 6 and reading down to verse 25, there is this word that keeps appearing. You go, well, what's the problem? Why do I keep falling? Why do I keep failing? Why, why am I getting beat up in this battle so much? And if you'll just kind of look at your Bible there, this will begin to emerge to you. I want you to see this. I want you to see what Paul is saying in verses 6 all the way down through verse 25. He keeps saying this thing about how I'm wrestling, I'm fighting, I'm giving it everything that I have. The very things I want to do, those are the things I don't do. I keep failing at this. I keep falling at this. Oh, wretched man that I am. He keeps saying it over and over again. And the one thing you will see Paul doing in verses 6 all the way there is he's fighting. He's, he might be getting beat up. But he's not going to abandon the fight. He's not going to quit. He's not going to cave. Here's what I understand a lot for us as Christians. We have wrestled and struggled and wrestled and struggled with the same things over and over and over that we've pushed them so far back down, kind of declaring defeat. I'll never win this battle. And those things are still holding us captive. There are Christians that just need to be set free of some things that are keeping them from being all that God has called them to be. And they've stuffed those things so far back almost as if to quit fighting it and just let it be. Just live there. And they've kind of thrown up their hands kind of like the first one. God, well, I'm a sinner anyway, so everybody does it. Is that okay? No. That's not what Jesus saved you to be. He saved you to an abundant life, to have victory over those things. And you and I need to recognize what the key is. There's a great old Puritan, John Owens, who wrote a bunch of books about sin. He was a Puritan. And here's what he said. You better be killing sin or it will kill you. That's powerful, isn't it? You better be killing it or it will kill you. And then he goes on to say this. If you are fighting sin, you're alive. Take heart. But if sin holds sway unopposed, you are dead no matter how lively this sin makes you feel. If sin goes unopposed, if you quit fighting, even though you're getting beat up in it, listen, what's it, it's going to hold sway over your life. It's going to begin to control you. A little bit more modern, Dr. Timothy Keller, he says this, we are free to fight sin and free to win, but we must still fight. Billy Sunday, great evangelist from the 1800s, he'd been a pro baseball player when God called him into the ministry. And Billy Sunday said this, I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as I have a foot. I'll fight it as long as I have a fist. I'll butt it as long as I have a head. I'll bite it as long as I have a tooth. And when I am old and footless and fistless and toothless, I'll gum it until I go home to glory and it goes home to perdition. That needs to be our resolve as Christians. I'm getting beat up. It's hard, but I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up the fight. I'm going to continue. Now you go, well, why was he getting beat up so bad? Well, now I told you, look at verses in your Bible. Look at verses 6 through 25. And there's this one little word that keeps kind of popping up, if you'll notice it. It's all through there. It's a little pronoun, and it's one letter word. What is it? I. I. You see it? I've done this. I've tried. I've fought. I've given it everything. I've, I And Paul is kind of revealing this to us here. He's kind of going, this is where I keep failing. This Just look at one verse. Look at verse 15 and notice this. It's pronounced in verse 15. Look what he says. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Six times in that one verse, he says, I, 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 I. Remember what the middle letter of sin is I right 
The problem is this. The longer we try to battle sin for ourselves in the flesh, the longer we're going to get beat up by it. That, that's the key. And Paul says, listen, look at, look at this passage again that we've been looking at in verses 14 through 25. I've done this. I've tried this. I've battled it. The very thing I don't want to do, that's what I keep doing. That's what keeps happening. And I love this when you kind of look at this passage. You go, why do I keep getting beat up? Because I'm the problem. I'm my own worst enemy with this. That's pretty powerful if you think about it. I mean, it's not until we recognize, listen, I can grit my teeth. I can bear down with everything that I have. I can determine I'm never going to do it again. But here's the problem I have. My old sin nature still hangs on. So I am going to lead I down to defeat every time. That's key. Now let me move into the final point in the little bit of time that we have left because have got to bring this one home, right? This is key. If I'm going to wrestle with sin, what's the key to victory? Judah Smith, written some tremendous Christian books, young, young preacher, and um, he's, a, he's an interesting one. But Judah Smith says this, and when I read this quote, I almost cried. Powerful. He said this, are you struggling? You could put wrestling in there. Are you struggling with sin? You don't need more willpower. You need more Jesus. Isn't that Good. Simple statement, right? Are you wrestling? We all are, right? Are you struggling with sin? You don't need more willpower. You're going to get beat by that willpower. You don't need more willpower. What do you need? More Jesus. More Jesus. Third, to find victory over sin. Believe God's provision. Stop trying to do it yourself. And put your faith and your trust in God's provision. You go, well, what, well, what is that? What, what's, what is God's provision? What is Paul leading up to in this passage of Scripture? What is he telling us in this passage of Scripture? Let, let me say this again. We don't wrestle with sin and win on our own. We're going to get beat up every single time. And the good news is we don't have to, Christian. Church, listen, we don't have to on our own. We don't have to be victorious on our own as believers. And as long as you're trying to do it on your own, you will never find victory over sin, ever. Those things will continue to hound you. They'll continue to beat up on you. You won't find victory in that. And Paul is telling us here in this passage in a clear way as he kind of finishes up that seventh chapter. Look down at verses 24 and the first part of verse 25. He tells us what the resource is, how we can win. Here's what he says. Look at verses 24 in the first part of verse 25. He says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I keep failing. I keep falling. Who's going to deliver me? And here's what he says. I know. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now think about this series for a minute. Let me take you back. I gave you those things at the beginning. Why is he reviewing all this? Because I want you to put this together. I want you to get this thing about wrestling. Okay, when did Jacob find victory as he wrestled with God? When he quit wrestling and started holding on to God. When he just started holding on to him. Can I just say it like this? He found victory when he surrendered his life fully to Jesus Christ, God. And said, God, you take me. I'm not fighting you anymore. I want to be all that you've called me to be. And he gave us. When did Paul find victory over wrestling with the enemy? Stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He found it in the resource, Jesus. And where did Paul find victory as he wrestled with sin? God's resource. I thank God through my Lord Jesus Christ who gives me the victory. You see it? What, what, what is the resource for me as I wrestle? With? Now, now, here's what I want you to understand. Listen, Jesus has already fought the fight. He's already gone to the cross. He's already won the victory, right? And so listen, I want to wrestle from the point of victory, not defeat. And I'm going to get beat up every single time. So what have I got to do? I've got to realize that the victory has been won through Jesus Christ. I don't have to give in to it. I don't have to cave into that. There is hope for you and I as believers. I love this. Years and years ago, and I'm going to date myself here, there was a Christian singer that was very popular by the name of Don Francisco. Anybody remember Don Francisco? just aged myself. 
Good, brother. <laughs> There's my friend back there. He remembers the Imperials. He remembers Don Francisco. He remembers Keith Green. He remembers all those good guys. Listen, go back and listen to some of that music. It was prophetic often in the things that he would say. Don Francisco sang lots of great songs like victory songs like I'm Forgiven. Great songs like that. Well, he wrote a song that I just love, and I was reminded of it as I was working on this sermon, and it's a song that's simple, simply called There's No Condemnation. And I want you to listen to these words for a second because I want to close this message out with you understanding this because Paul is in the book of Romans. Now remember, Scripture was not originally written with chapter verses, with, with chapter markings and verse distinguishing. It all just kind of read like one straight statement, okay? And so kind of keep that in mind. But, but here's Don Francisco's words. Listen to this. Here's what he says. Sitting by my window on a rainy afternoon, everything inside my head was playing out of tune. I was thinking of the fool I made of me the night before. In front of God and everyone, I'd sinned and sinned some more. Well, I thought of all the things I'd done. I winced at things I'd said. I wallowed in self-pity. I hung my worried head. Have you ever felt like that? And right when I was so far down that even up looked wrong, that's when Jesus gave to me the chorus of this song. He said, Satan, the accuser, has been whispering in your ear. You just tell him you're forgiven that he has no business here. Because it doesn't matter what you've done, it matters who you'll be. There is no condemnation when the Son has set you free. Now, look at this. Take your Bible and look at this with me. Here's how Paul ends this. Remember, there's no, there's no chapter divisions. There's no verses here. But look at your Bible there because here's what he says, verse 24. A wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this wrestling match? I'm getting beat up. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And here's what he says. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And look at verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see the hope that's there? Listen, you're going to wrestle with sin as a believer. You're going to wrestle. And you're going to get beat up in that wrestling match. But God has given us a provision in Jesus Christ. You and I have hope in him. Who will deliver us from this wrestling match? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me forward a prayer? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask our instrumentalists just to begin to play our hymn of invitation, if they would just quietly, as we just for a moment reflect on what God is saying in our own life. You see, I think that brings us from God's word right down to the point of response to him. And I recognize that a message like this is pretty heavy, so there's going to be some wrestling with God's voice in our life right now. And there's going to be some wrestling with the enemy because he's going to whisper in your, in your ear, oh, you're not so bad. Oh, that's just the preacher being all about sin again, stepping on people's toes. You don't need to respond. You, you don't need to do anything here. Just, you're okay. The truth of the matter is we're wrestling with some things in our life. Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have life more abundantly. He wants us to have victory in this wrestling match. I believe that. He wants us to recognize that we can't, but He can. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you've never accepted Him as your Savior, your Lord, listen, He's already won the fight. Put your faith and your trust in Him. Invite Him in. Let Him have control. It's the only way you're going to win. And if you're here as a Christian and there's some things that have been dogging you, some things holding you back, some things you've been struggling with, listen, I can tell you, it's time for you to stop wrestling and start holding on to Jesus. Trust it into his hands. He can give you the victory. In just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to open this service. We're going to worship the Lord together. We're going to sing this song. Without him, I could do nothing. That's a great declaration, and it's true. With him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can. You can overcome those things that you're wrestling with. 
through him. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word today. It's powerful. It's pointed. It's life-changing. Help us to experience that change this morning right here in this place to your glory. We invite your Holy Spirit to move on us. God, we won't be embarrassed about stepping out in faith to profess you as our Lord and Savior. God, I pray for those who may need to respond in that way today. Give them the courage to do that. And for believers, maybe right here in this room who've struggled with things a long time, God, help us to admit we wrestle, to confess our defeat, and put our trust, our belief, our faith in your provision, Jesus Christ. God, what you do here in this time, during this invitation time this morning, we'll give you the praise and the glory. We love you. We worship you. We praise you. Give us the courage to respond to you now. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our hymn of invitation? The words will be on the screen for you. If you need to come, trace here. I'll be here. The altar's open. If you want to pray with one of us, you come. But let's worship.